It is a common assumption in the church, and outside the church for that matter, that God's domain is infinite in time and space. He rules everywhere and without restriction. Yet this cannot be so. God the Father is a descendant of a long line of gods who also rule in the vast expanse we call the universe. We know from the principle of eternalism that space and time are infinite. In ultimate terms of reference, there has been no beginning to time and there is no end to space. Though space and time are infinite, as is God, this does not mean that infinite time and space are the sole domain of our Father in Heaven. We know from Revelation and the teachings of Joseph Smith that there are other gods who also rule and reign. As William W. Phelps intimated in his famous hymn, there is a race of gods which extends backwards infinitely, having no beginning. Brother Phelps learned the doctrine from Joseph Smith, who declared the existence of the race of gods emphatically in his King Follett Discourse. Our own Father in Heaven was once a mortal being like unto ourselves, meaning that he served a higher God before reaching his present exalted status. The point is that there is an infinite race of gods who sit on thrones of glory and rule in everlasting power throughout the universe. Our Heavenly Father is not the only God of the universe. Each of the infinite number of gods, like our Heavenly Father, is a king and rules on a throne. Each king rules over a kingdom, just like their terrestrial counterparts. Jesus Christ described the nature of kingdoms in a revelation to Joseph Smith. As the Lord indicated, each kingdom has a space, meaning it has defined boundaries. He also made it clear that there is a hierarchy of kingdoms. There are greater and lesser kingdoms. Additionally, each of these kingdoms have been given a law. The law given each kingdom defines it, including its bounds and conditions. The universe is not simply a vast expanse of planets, stars, and galaxies independent unto themselves. It is organized into an infinite assembly of kingdoms, with each kingdom having bounds, limitations, and laws. As the Savior himself stated, there is no part of space, meaning the universe as a whole, where there is no kingdom. Joseph Smith further explained that this organization of kingdoms in the universe is ongoing. When our local iteration of the plan of salvation was proposed, it was organized along the same pattern as has been used throughout the eternities. The 
The worlds of our system have limits and bounds fixed to ensure perfect order and harmony, not just for ourselves, but for the larger universe. The pattern of bounded and limited kingdoms is followed within a kingdom. In this dispensation, the kingdom of God on earth has its external limits, but it also has its internal bounds and limits. We call this priesthood jurisdiction. As members of the church are well aware, priesthood holders and officers can only act within their specific jurisdictions. Priesthood keys are hierarchical and are delegated from the president of the church downward along geographical and ecclesiastical lines. Priesthood leaders preside within geographic boundaries and their authority does not extend beyond them. A bishop exercises his authority within a ward. A stake president exercises his authority within a stake. A mission president exercises his authority within a mission. Even the general authorities have a bounded priesthood jurisdiction. There are three presiding quorums with larger jurisdictions, which the Church calls general authorities. Their geographic jurisdictions are quite specific as given in the Revelations. The First Presidency presides over both the Melchizedek Priesthood and the Church of Jesus Christ. The first is a functional jurisdiction and the second a geographical jurisdiction. Geographically speaking, the First Presidency presides over the organized church, or in other words, the combined stakes of Zion. The Lord repeatedly calls the First Presidency the First Presidency of the Church and not the First Presidency in all the world. The Quorum of Twelve Apostles, on the other hand, is a traveling council with authority outside the organized stakes of the church. The Lord calls this jurisdiction in all the world. The 70 are to act in all the world as they assist the 12. The keys of the fullness of the priesthood, which encompass the sealing power, is also bounded. Its authority is given to only one person on this earth. Priesthood authority, even at the most general and extensive level, does not exceed the confines of this earth. The idea that all priesthood jurisdictions, whether on earth or throughout the universe, are bounded spatially, can be codified into a general principle, the local principle. Put another way, all things are local. When the scriptures and the revelations talk about priesthood office or calling or ecclesiastical organization, the context is always a local one. Edward Partridge's authority as a bishop, for example, extended only within the bounded and local sphere of his calling. Bishop Partridge had no authority anywhere on earth, let alone in the universe, outside his specified jurisdiction. This may seem obvious, but it is extremely important. The Church, both its leadership and membership, 
violates this simple principle in many important ways. The principle applies to more than just priesthood organization. The local principle applies to the revelations and doctrines as well. The Book of Moses records that the great prophet was taken up to an exceedingly high mountain where God spoke to him face to face. God showed Moses some of his works, but not all, because they are without number. The reason that God did not show Moses all his creations was not because it was impossible. He could have done so, but then Moses would no longer be able to remain in the flesh. But God had a work for Moses to do, which required the prophet to remain in mortality. Moses' work, or priesthood assignment as we might call it today, was spatially limited. It had a jurisdiction, which the Lord immediately defined for the prophet. God informed Moses he was in the world. The world was to be his priesthood jurisdiction. God then showed the prophet his jurisdiction. In a subsequent conversation with God, Moses was again shown the earth and its inhabitants. God reiterated the limits to what he would reveal to Moses, confining any revelation to this earth. The curious fact is that God informs Moses that there have been worlds and atoms without number. The Gospel plan as we know it has been repeated infinitely. Notwithstanding the infinite nature of the plan of salvation, Moses was confined to this earth. God made it clear that he would restrict specific information to this earth and its inhabitants. Indeed, the creation account given to Moses, which he wrote down, pertains to this heaven and this earth and to nothing else. The salient point is that the creation accounts recorded by Moses in Genesis and in the Book of Moses pertain to this earth and its planetary relations, and not to the universe at large. The accounts are local. The spatial restrictions of the scriptures as encapsulated in the local principle extend beyond the creation accounts. God has always limited his communications to mankind within what is appropriate for our understanding. While God has informed man from time to time of the existence of the larger picture, he has never laid out the details. We are given only what we need to know to work within our local jurisdiction. Unfortunately, the modern church does not understand the local principle, let alone apply it. The most important example of this lack of understanding is the Atonement of Jesus Christ. The scriptures repeatedly point out that the Atonement of Jesus Christ is infinite in nature. What does infinite atonement really mean? 
The word infinite has several definitions that may apply. These definitions are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but they do carry different implications. Some definitions are quantitative in nature, such as infinite space and infinite number. Others are qualitative, such as infinite patience or mercy. Both quantitative and qualitative definitions can apply at the same time, but it is also true that one may apply and the other may not. How does one decide which is the proper definition of infinite as applied to the atonement of Jesus Christ in the scriptures? Depending upon the source, the modern church has applied each or all the possible definitions of infinite to the atonement. Elder Russell M. Nelson, in a conference address, covered all the bases. His atonement is infinite, without an end. It was also infinite in that all humankind would be saved from never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of his immense suffering. It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was to be done once for all. And the mercy of the atonement extends not only to an infinite number of people, but also to an in infinite number of worlds created by him. It was infinite beyond any human scale of measurement or mortal comprehension. According to Elder Nelson, the atonement is both qualitatively and quantitatively infinite. It is beyond mortal comprehension and applies to an infinite number of worlds and people. Apparently, infinite is simply infinite and can be nothing else. The local principle dictates that the atonement of Jesus Christ cannot be infinite quantitatively. The atonement cannot apply to an infinite number of worlds or people. Like any action or ordinance within the gospel, the atonement can only apply within the appropriate priesthood jurisdiction, which is, in this case, our earth. The atonement can only be infinite qualitatively. It is infinite in mercy, forgiveness, and the expiation of sin. If the local principle is valid and applies to the atonement of Jesus Christ, then there should be evidence in the scriptures to support the premise. The scriptures should be able to decide the question whether the atonement extends beyond our earth and its inhabitants or not. The scriptures are quite explicit and consistent that the atonement of Jesus Christ is limited to our earth and its inhabitants. The limited locality of the atonement is expressed in various ways. We start with the sins of the world. When Jesus approached John to be baptized, John openly declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. The Apostle John made a similar claim in his first general epistle. In both cases, the Greek word translated as world is cosmos, which can be translated as world or universe. At least one translation of the verse does use the second meaning. However, other statements throughout the scriptures regarding the sins of the world make it clear that the world refers to our planet and not to the entire universe. Paul, for example, used the same word, cosmos, in his epistle to the Hebrews, but combined it with a specific temporal context. 
Since the universe had no foundation or beginning, the suffering for sin can only refer to our world, called by Paul, the cosmos. Nor will the universe have an end, while our current world will. The Book of Moses applies the effects of the Atonement to the foundation of the world. The Lord himself, in a revelation to Joseph Smith, coupled his sacrifice for the sins of the world with his name signifying the beginning and the end. The Book of Mormon prophet Abinadi pointed out that the sins covered by the redemption extended back in time to the beginning of the world. Again, this can only refer to our world and not the universe as a whole. In a priesthood revelation to Joseph Smith given in 1832, Jesus Christ emphatically stated that the whole world groaned under the burden of sin. He put it in the present tense, even now. The sins of the whole world in this case cannot refer to the entire universe, unless we are to assume that the infinite number of celestial kingdoms throughout the universe are also groaning under sin and darkness. Finally, when the Lord appeared to the Nephites after his resurrection, he informed them that he was the God of the whole earth, not the whole universe, and was slain for the sins of the world, meaning the earth. The scriptures are also explicit on the point that the atonement covers only the family of our Adam. It does not cover the families of the infinite number of Adams that have preceded our world. The Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught that although the atonement was infinite, it covered only the men, women, and children who belonged to our Adam. Mormon, when addressing the Gentiles of the latter days, stated emphatically that every soul who belongs to the whole human family of Adam will stand before the judgment seat. King Benjamin explained that the atonement was prepared from the foundation of the world. His statement implies that the atonement could not apply retroactively to the worlds preceding our own world. He further explained that all mankind referred to only those who lived after the fall of Adam. In passing, we must note that the temple endowment repeatedly specified the focus of the gospel plan as Adam and Eve and their posterity. Every instruction, commandment, and covenant was given to initiates representing Adam, Eve, and their posterity, and no one else. The scriptures unequivocally testify that the atonement of Jesus Christ covers the family of our Adam and none else. After all, the entire plan of salvation, including the atonement, was ordained in the premortal council, which included all those spirits who would inhabit our earth. It was a matter of common consent of all those involved, which did not include the inhabitants of worlds without number. The council approved the great Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The scriptures are also insistent that the atonement was necessary in part due to the transgression of Adam, also known as the fall. 
It was not an infinite number of transgressions by an infinite number of atoms, nor was it an infinite number of falls that set in motion the atonement of Jesus Christ. It was one Adam who fell and one Christ who atoned for the fall. The transgression and subsequent fall of Adam brought death into the world. It is the atonement of Jesus Christ that will bring about the resurrection, thus conquering death. Again, one man, Adam, brought death into the world, and it was one man, Jesus Christ, who overcame death through the resurrection. Samuel the Lamanite prophesied to the Nephites of the death of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross brought to pass the resurrection and redemption from the first death, or spiritual death, brought on by Adam's fall. Of course, the first death can only be so within the local context of our world. There is no first death in the infinite and eternal context of the entire universe. The Apostle Paul testified to the Corinthians that Jesus Christ was the first fruits of them that slept. He meant that Jesus Christ was the first to be risen from the dead. Lehi, in his counsel to his youngest son Jacob, made the connection between being the first fruits of the resurrection and being the first to rise from the dead. The term first fruits is a reference to harvesting, where the first fruits are the earliest crop of the year. The term has come to mean the first products or results of anything. Ancient Israel, by the command of God, offered the first fruits of their harvest to the priest, who then placed the basket at the altar. Like all things in the Law of Moses, the offering of the first fruits typified Jesus Christ. Similarly, Adam was commanded of the Lord to offer the firstlings of his flocks. This was done to typify the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, as the Book of Moses makes clear. Both the firstlings and the first fruits typified the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first to rise from the dead. Like the first death, the first fruits of the resurrection can only be true within the context of the local principle. Jesus Christ is the first to rise from the dead in this world. God the Father was resurrected in an earlier iteration of the plan of salvation on another world. So, too, all the infinite gods of eternity. <laughs>